Tromsø in Norway. Uh, his specialty is in polar literature, expedition, and also in images of the north. Uh, he has worked at the University of Tromsø since 1996, and his talk today is on Arctic pastoral. Um, everyone should have one of these handouts. Henning is not using the PowerPoint, so you will need one of these for his presentation. Everyone have one? Yeah? Okay, Henry, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, you don't actually need it, and I'm sorry <coughs> for the big handout, but I uh, also had bad experiences with conferences. <laughs> uh, bring a uh, PowerPoint, and for some reason it, it doesn't work. Uh, but here everything seems to work fine, so I could have brought it. But, uh, but you have some of the quotes, not all of them, uh, and some of the people, some of the books, uh, so more for entertainment, maybe. So, the Arctic pastoral. Uh, my paper focuses on aspects of the Nordic polar literature from the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century to see if a term such as ideal or pastoral may be an appropriate term for investigating aspects, aspects of this non-fiction genre. It may seem like a strange choice of terms since the concept of the Arctic is associated with a whole range of words like cold, icy waters, shipwrecks, frostbite, hunger, suffering, and death. And this is, of course, not, not without reason. Examples of expedition failures are many. Also from hunting and wintering, the list of tragedies is long. Can it then make any sense to talk about Arctic ideal? When Helge Ingstad's book Pelsiegeli from 1931 was published in English translation in 1933. Ingstad chose the title The Land of Feast and Famine. The last term in the title, famine, is probably what is often associated with the polar regions, while the feast is a much less familiar image. Nevertheless, it is this pastoral side of polar literature I will focus on in the following, a type of modern pastoral that has affinity to the genre of nature writing, to eco-criticism, and also to vitalism. In Greg Garrett's book, Eco-Criticism from 2004, pastoral and apocalypse are viewed as two of the most powerful genres in eco-criticism when it comes to rousing people to action for environmental protection. The pastoral creates images of a better life, a rural existence with humans in harmony with their cultural surroundings, while the uh, apocalypse depicts an urban hell after the collapse of the ecosystem and civilization. One often thinks of pastoral merely as a historical genre, a kind of poetry about shepherds and country life, written in Greek and Roman antiquity with a new resurgence in the pastoral novel and drama in Renaissance England and France, with offshoots in the poetry of the Romantic Age. But pastoral may also, according to Gerard, be seen as any literature that describes the country with an, with an implicit or explicit contrast to the urban. In his book, What is Pastoral from 1996, Paul Alpers argues for not limiting the concept pastoral to, gold, to lost golden age, nor to a particular landscape. Furthermore, to Alpers, pastoral is not a particular genre. Pastoral is rather a mode in the sense of an attitude or tone in the text. Alpers might not recognize the text I treat here as pastoral. The shepherd in the classical pastoral is living in a locus amunus, a garden-like landscape with trees, grass, and water, an idealized place where you feel safety and comfort. In the Arctic, the landscape itself may constitute a danger. Nevertheless, there are several similarities in the sensibility towards nature, which I hope to show in the following. In 1892, Fritjof Nansen was interviewed in the British newspaper The Town Now Gazette. Nansen was then in the process of planning the Fram expedition to the North Pole and had behind him in 1888 to 1889 a crossing of the Greenland ice sheet from east to west, as well as a winter stay in Nuuk, or Gotthold as it was called then. Moreover, he had in 1882 traveled with a sealer to the hunting grounds in the West Ice near Jan Mayen. 
What do you associate with the Arctic? The, the reporter asked, asks. And Nansen interestingly, interestingly answered. And this is on your handout. I think of the Arctic <coughs> and the rain. I think of the sunshine reflected from mountains of snow and ice, shining upon little lakes of clear rippling water where hundreds of seals playfully splash the water into glistening sprays of rainbow hues. What is the charm of the Arctic? Health, glorious health. Your muscles twitch with a desire for action. Eat like a horse and sleep 12 or 14 hours without a dream. Before you is the vast unknown. All around you is silence and solitude. In winter the scene is almost as beautiful as in summer. The nights are clear, the moon and stars shine brightly upon the sea of soft white snow. In a eulogy for Nansen given in 1930, Knut Rasmussen, the great Danish polar explorer, writes, With Nansen, for the first time, Arctic nature is brought into literature. Before, it was just an image of terror and suffering. Now, it shines forth in the richness of un unimagined colors. The first white man had glimpsed into the heart of the polar lands and understood their beauty. Thus, it may be argued that the Arctic pastoral begins with Nansen. In Alper's view, the hubris of man and civilization is in the pastoral <coughs> scale down to the shepherd, a figure of humility. The pastoral involves living in the world in an active and attentive manner, an expression Alpers uses that I find useful when it comes to the Arctic text is a life of conscious simplicity. Simpl simplicity is also projected by the huts in which the trappers in the Arctic live in. This is how Mani Volstad depicts her residence in Hohenschönswald at her arrival in 1932 in her book The First Woman as a Trapper on Svalbard. Uh, this is on your handout, I think. Up here we build neither storehouse, brewery or boathouse. The chalet consists only of a low house, about 8 meters long and 3 meters wide. On the side facing the endless ocean is a large window, three square window panes wide and two high. In stormy weather, we cut and chop firewood indoors, as well as skinning the fox and thawing the polar bear and preparing meat and fur. Everything is done in our living room. The importance of tending to one's daily task with diligence is well described in an autobiography by Henry Rudy from one of his reflections about the trapper life in Svalbard. This is also on the handout. Freedom does not mean to relax for days in a cozy and warm cabin. Freedom means taking care of one's tools and gear every single day so you can say to yourself that no, I have done what should be done. I have prevailed over the external forces, which is bad weather and darkness. I have prevailed over the inner problems, indifference and melancholy. I have won over powerful forces, therefore I am free. Up in the north, they stand out in their stark reality, keep on working or surrender. The life in the Arctic is portrayed in terms of simplicity and, and uh, uh, equivocalness, as a contrast to modernism's complexity. The popularity of these polar books is probably, probably due to the fact that they show that in the combination of explorer and hunter lies a kind of true, authentic way of life that the man of modern civilization only knows as utopia. While modernism postulates heterogeneity and change, the Arctic landscape is perceived by many of the writers as being in a continuous tradition from time immemorial. In the Polar Explorer, Jon Javers' book, Animal Trails and Bird Migration, in Norwegian, Dyre Trok og Fule Trek på 74 grader nord from East Greenland, the following reflection on the Arctic opens the first chapter. What made me come back to these lands behind sea and ice year after year was first of all the wildlife. There, the Creator's elementary laws lay naked and open on snow and rock, and they were easy to read and understand. A similar reflection is to be found in Fritjof Nansen's introductory chapter to Eskimo Life from 1891. 
Everything in Greenland is simple and great. White snow, blue ice, naked black rocks and peaks and dark stormy sea. At the root of pastoral is the ideal nature as a stable and enduring counterpoint to the disruptive energy and change of human societies, Greg Garrett writes. This is an aspect we find in many travelogues from the Arctic. In Eskimo life, for instance, Nansen detects Greenland thus. It is strong and wide, this nature, like a saga of antiquity carved in ice and stone. In the book East of the Great Glacier from 1935, Gergingstad describes his winterings in East Greenland in 1932-33 as being in a lonely landscape, in all its sober strength, in the fairy light of stars and the shimmering aurora. The landscape demand, demands for Ingsta another way of living, a life of conscious simplicity, to use Alper's term. On the one hand, the style in the east of the great glacier is simple and without gestures or ornaments. Here is a river and I'm tired, it's a quote. On the other hand, life as such is characterized by simplicity. For three days we strolled on, slept in a tent and boiled the water for our tea of a fire of fragrant heather the silent joy of vagabond life in the mountains of Greenland. A habit of orderliness has to be learned, not as a convention, but as a necessity, because the work and preparations have an immediate effect on their lives. The landscape is depicted as both simple and majestic. The daily tasks are portrayed one by one without conflict conflicting considerations, and the silence stands in contrast to the urban Cacophony. According to Greg Gerard, the pastoral celebrates a bountiful present. Numerous examples of this is to be found in another book by Ingsta, The Land of Feast and Famine, Pelle from 1931, from Northern Canada, where he lived as a hunter for four years. On the table in our cabin stand a pot of steaming venison stew, a bowl containing two thick beaver tails saved for this special occasion and a cup of cranberry sauce. We begrudge ourselves nothing. <coughs> in the classical ideal, the shepherds meet, have conversations, and sing, recite verses, and talk about love. Is there any parallel in polar literature in this respect? Is it not rather characterized by silence as, and solitude, as we heard from Nansen's account? Well, in expedition life and hunting, there will, however, be conversations and gatherings in the evenings among the men themselves and when they meet with other men or expeditions. In Elgingsa's books from the Arctic, there is a countless number of meetings and conversations, song and dance. The chapters live separately, alone, and the Indians live in their extended families and tribes. However, as Ingsta writes, in spite of the fact that we differ in many respects, the country seems to bind us together. One can here draw a parallel to the shepherds in the classical ideal. It's the life and the landscape that unites them. On the one hand, polar expeditions in the late 1800s are expressions of science and uh, rationality, with polar voyages as exponents of, uh, exponents of civilization's very latest technology. On the other hand, yearning towards the desert Arctic is seen as a way to escape modernity. The Arctic expeditions from 1890s onwards does not necessarily argue for the expansion of civilization with science as companion, but just as often take a critical stand. According to this line of thinking, explorers say north not to extend, but to escape the reach of civilization, to find a route that return them in a symbolic sense to the original state of nature. As Jonathan Bate observes with, with reference to William Wordsworth, pastoral is not a myth, but a psychological necessity. Pastoral is, a, is quote, a way of connecting the self to the environment, unquote. The same can be said about the Arctic pastoral. Moreover, it may be suggested that in the fascination for the periphery lies a suspicion that the periphery is in fact the real center, or perhaps more correctly formulated, that wilderness and the Arctic possesses qualities which point towards the essence of human life. One can also draw lines to the modern deep ecology. The Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness, the founder of deep ecology, who called his philosophy 
Ecosophy, launched in 1974, nine po points to reach a lifestyle that can put man more in line with his natural surroundings. This emphasizes on high degree of self-reliance and lifestyles that combine maximum enjoyment and realization of one's own values by using a minimum of complicating aids. These are characteristics that also fit parts of life in the Arctic, the way we find it depicted in many te <coughs> texts. In that respect, one could state that reading and working with these texts can inspire to live more in harmony with ecological ideals. The pastoral mode is different from the typical assertion of masculinity discourse which is to be found in much of the polar literature, when a man proves himself in a series of tests <coughs> that, if passed, will confirm his superiority of the North, rivers called emptiness, its wild animals and other human beings. The pastoral has more to do with being at peace in a place, transforming the wilderness to a place to dwell, take under one's care as home, in a high Ligurian uh, sense, I think. However, the ideal of rural tranquility has by some been criticized for being a vehicle for sublimated bourgeois ideology, a nostalgic retreat into the past, or a imperial colonial desire with fantasies of domination, more than a catalyst for the active transformation of established social structures. The pastoral is heavily dependent on the very class system it claims temporarily to suspend, silencing less privileged group, groups, some critics state. This is being discussed by Graham Hogan and Helen Tiffin in Postcolonial Ecocriticism from 2010. However, they also point to the fact that the pastoral might have an imaginative potential for the assertion of a new and better world and that former settler colonies, like in the Caribbean, seems to adapt pastoral to their own interest, reimagining identity as conditioned by a dynamic interaction between place and displacement. They also cite Terry Gifford, who, in his book Pastoral from 1999, see an alternative pastoral emerge based on the idea of land as collective resource and not an uh, uh, individual luxury. In the article Radical Pastoral from 1996, Gregor investigates the possibility utopian elements in the genre and also the counter arguments. Here he writes about the pastoral, I quote, it may cloud our social vision or open up a human ecological one. It may help in the mar mar marginalization of nature into pretty ghettos or and gender a genuine counter hegemonic ideology. If pastoral can be radical, if it has been so, it is not as a finished model, exhortation or ideology, but as a questioning. Radical pastoral appears, this question appears as the political, poetical question of belonging of the root of human being on this earth. Unquote. In the text I've been discussing here, the Arctic is is very much regarded as a collective resource, and Helge Ingstad, by others, criticized the idea of hunting for sports only available for a certain privileged group, and out of touch with the genius, uh, genius Loki, the spirit of place. Uh, so, I think I used my time there, so I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. really very interesting. I, I love all the pictures that you've got in here of, of the, the, the one in front of the, the cover. Which one is which on here? Can it's uh, Peter Franson to the left, so Peggy Ingstein in the middle, and Peter Asmussen to the right. That's fine. The, the Danish, uh, Thank you for that. But, but there are also, I only have one woman here, then, Wally, Wally Wolstan, but uh, in my research group in, in Tromsø called uh, Arctic Modernities and also another research group called Arctic um, Discourses. And several of my colleagues work on, on, uh, on uh, the women in the Arctic, uh, the, the wives of the um, scientists, trappers, uh, we, and, and also some of them 
uh, going there on their own as artists or maybe also as, uh, scientists or travelers. So um, uh, it's it has been a main focus on land, but but when you look closely, I mean, there are quite a lot of uh, women that has kind of another perspective on, on the Arctic and, and that's filling in the story. So, uh, and, and um, one of my colleagues has written an article on women on, on Svalbard. Uh, and you can find, we have an open access journal in terms of called Nordic, N-O-R-D-L-I-T, and we have published many special issues on the North. Uh, we also have two large uh, con international conferences, so we have published quite a lot of articles in, in this journal. So. And many of them, very many of them are in English, not all of them, but many of them. So. Mm. So you can, uh, and also a book I would like to mention called Arctic Discourses that might be of interest for, for some of you. Um, we have first question there. Okay. Sure. Hi, thanks very much for that interesting paper. Just following on from what you were saying about the gender dimensions, mm. um, uh, I was thinking about somebody like Isabella, Isabel Wiley Hutchison, Scottish um, traveller and botanist uh, and filmmaker, okay. who travelled with Rasmussen. Um, uh, okay. in the Arctic and um, uh, one of the interesting things is that for example when she was invited to speak and publish in the Royal Geographical Society one of the things that she had to think about was what material she had to keep back for more popular income generating publications um, because many travellers had to fund their travels uh, uh, through travel books if they weren't already being funded through things like hunting or something like that. And I just wondered, was there a parallel for these men that you've looked at in terms of their accounts? Was it important to create a particular popular narrative that was marketable and saleable, that would have an audience? And what, what, what impact do you think that had yeah. on the way in which they wrote about the Arctic? It, it was important, like Edouard Amundsen, immediately after every expedition he published the book. And, and it's quite... He, he couldn't wait uh, sometimes uh, until the expedition had really finished, like his book about the uh, South Pole. If you want to read about the very last part of the expedition, with the, with the return and his... Uh, travels uh, across the USA, giving talks and so on, you have to read that in his next expedition book. So it was very uh, important to, to, um, to get the book on the market very quickly and, and to profit for, uh, from that. And, uh, um, and you ask uh, how would that influence what they write? Quite a lot, of course. I mean, so nowadays, the diaries of, of these travelers are being published online. So then you can compare their diaries to, to the book and a, a lot of things are omitted, especially uh, conflicts among the group, very tense conflicts, suicides, there are many suicides. I mean, you will rare, very rarely find that in the published book. Uh, but also because the book was often interesting, it kind of a new genre like uh, uh, Fritjof Nansen, when he had done this crossing of Greenland, had published the book, The First Crossing of Greenland in 1890. It's a mixture of book. I mean, it's a travel log, it, but also it's also the scientific report. He didn't split that. So when, when it came to the publisher, the publisher said, this is interesting, but we have to take out the scientific part and publish that part. Uh, but he said, no, I want it to be there all together. And he said, this will never sell. And he lost his publisher. And he went to another one, and he took the chance, and it, it became a huge success. So it was on the market at the same time as Knut Hamsun's debut novel, Hunger. And, uh, and uh, Hunger is now very famous, but it didn't sell very much. Uh, it was beaten by Fritjof Nansen, so this new, new narrative mixing uh, travelogue and, and hunting tales and... Uh, documentary and scientific report, everything is, is put in the same book. But people seem to like it and still do today. I mean, they're very popular. They're very much read. Hello, question. It's, it's kind of along very much, you've almost answered most of it, but I was wondering how they um, compared to diaries and how much they were influenced by the fact that they were going to be published. And whether, how they compared to the diaries of people who never published, just diaries of 
people up in the north, but who were just writing a diary? Well, they're on an uh, organized expedition. I guess that all the men knew that their diaries might be read. But there are quite a lot of diaries of an art. My grandfather was a fur trader and I've got his diaries. Right, there are very many diaries. And diaries like his, I guess. He, he didn't expect it to be read by yeah, exactly. all the audience. So, that's a, so when he, it's in a way more interesting to, to read the diaries by the trappers and the hunters because yeah. they didn't expect to make a book. But, but uh, when we read from, from the group of men <coughs> traveling with Amundsen and Nansen, you find them some more information in the diaries and some criticism and something about the complex, but not very much, but because they knew that the diaries might not be published, but by be read, so they were not totally private. And have people looked at the diaries of other people, of just the ordinary people up there? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah, we, we uh, absolutely do that, and, and that's very interesting. And even these diaries are not being published, actually. Yeah. by small publishing firms, these uh, very private diaries, yeah. and, and, and they, they are actually the most interesting material. Mm -hmm. well, you also have a question? Um, you, uh, you, you talked about pastoral being this um, uh, negotiation between human and the natural world, and uh, the human shaping the natural world. Um, and in several of the examples you got, I, you sort of see two parallel versions of that. Um, Wally Walstad and uh, Henry Rudy, they seem to emphasize more the human interactive part. Um, I mean, when, when Henry Rudy talks about, I prevailed over the external forces, I have won over powerful forces, even the title of peace period coming, there, there's a, this is a hierarchy, there's power being exerted, as opposed to Manson who talks about the silence and the rain and the sea. It's almost as if the human is barely there. Yeah. Um, are these understood as separable narrative strains, separate sort of separable rhetorical approaches? Or? Well, that's that's a good point. Lanson is is really more the man from the big city. When it comes to to uh, East Greenland, he, he writes in his diary, "It's the most beautiful thing I ever seen." He has two Sami expedition members, and they and one of them he wrote in his diary, "This is the most terrible, ugly landscape I've ever seen," because he could never live there. It was impossible to make a living. So they hated uh, Greenland until they came to the west coast. And then there he wrote in the diary, here I could make a living. I mean, and for nonsense, then he stops almost depicting the landscape. So he has the more kind of urban, uh, aesthetic view to the landscape. Yeah. Uh, stop there. Okay, sorry. sorry. Yes, yeah, um, sorry. sorry. Once again, thank you very much, Henning. If you want to discuss it further, then we'll get copyright. Okay? <laughs>